Hello again, and uh, I want to turn our attention now to what the significance of the last study with Wendell Stanley, and then what are viruses? Uh, so Wendell Stanley, I just, we finished our other video, Wendell Stanley in 1935 was able to crystallize the uh, TMV particles, the virus particles. And one of the things that we realized is that even keeping them in many years, the crystallized virus could still be virulent, which implies that there's no metabolism. The virus crystals didn't get bigger, right? They weren't reproducing. Um, and they certainly weren't needing any oxygen or carbon dioxide. They certainly didn't need any food. So there was really this you know, what are these things? What are viruses? And, and so the more we started to understand, then we had the electron microscope, which was able to actually discover what they look like. We realized the, um, ramifications of what they are. Uh, so, uh, let's take a look at what these are. So viruses, um, are simply a combination of DNA or RNA, a nucleic acid, and then proteins. There's no organelles, there's no nucleus, there's no ribosomes, there's no lysosomes, there are no organelles. So viruses are not cellular. All viruses have capsid proteins and the capsid is the outer shell and it protects the nucleic acid inside. Um, now the capsid proteins, a part of them are gonna be what we call spike proteins. Now spike proteins protrude, they have a very, very specific shape, unique to each virus or family of viruses. And even among the family of viruses, each virus within that family has a unique shape. And these spikes are going to fit in a receptor on a particular cell that it infects. So there's some common themes that we've done before, right? We've got a specific shape, uh, 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 key and a specific shape, uh, lock. And those two are going to be very, very, uh, complementary. Uh, now viruses, either have DNA or RNA, but not both. Uh, and it could be a double stranded DNA, a single stranded DNA. It could be a double stranded RNA. It could be a single stranded RNA. Um, so all sorts of variations in the nucleic acid. So we categorize them based upon what kind of DNA or RNA they have. Oftentimes you might find proteins within the capsid that are not the shell, but are proteins that are needed if the virus is going to infect a cell. Maybe these are um, um, retro viruses that have reverse transcriptase enzymes that allow them to go from RNA to DNA. Uh, but these are proteins that are going to be helpful for a virus as it gets in. But notice, <laughs> no ER, no Golgi, no mitochondria, not cellular. Uh, now, some viruses also have what we call an envelope. And again, that's something that we can use to classify viruses. Envelopes are actually membranes, but they're not part of the virus structure itself in the sense that it's not viral derived. These are... Uh, derived from the host cell as the virus leaves. So as the viral capsid and spike proteins, as it leaves the cell, it gets wrapped in part of the host cell membrane. Uh, so you have a little activity here where you guys can drag the uh, names of the parts to the right cell part. So see if you can, um, um, take some time. There's a link to the uh, picture that this corresponds to. And so you guys can hit pause uh, before you continue and kind of work through this uh, picture. 
Okay, so as you uh, completed that, we can talk about a little bit more of how a virus um, is classified and how it replicates. And then we've got some good information about the different types of viruses we have seen and recorded. Uh, so um, in your Google Doc, you would have recorded um, what are the different types of virus shapes. Now your book goes over helical, polyhedral, spherical, and then it, it, it doesn't name the bacteriophages in terms of its shape, but they're called complex viruses. Uh, but notice they all have something in common. We all see, we see a nucleic acid. Here's RNA, here's DNA, here's another RNA, here's another DNA. Notice we have the capsid proteins and notice the capsid proteins usually are in this very, very interesting, like uh, wonderful mathematical pattern and so especially the polyhedral. Uh, they kind of fit together like these little puzzles and it's pretty cool. And so uh, just like making a little Lego uh, shell where everything kind of links together, the proteins come together to create this very unique shape. Uh, so uh, notice some of these have an envelope uh, and some of them don't. And uh, we're going to also take a look at bacteriophages because that's one of the earliest viruses we were able to figure out and study. Uh, so you're going to uh, take a look at some of these um, together um, and uh, in terms of how they operate. Now, viruses have a really, really fascinating way that they can replicate. They themselves cannot replicate on their own. They're not a cell, there's no mitosis, there's no uh, replication of DNA on their own. Um, I'm gonna say that a couple more times, you're gonna get sick of me saying that, but viruses are not cells. So if they have no metabolism, if they don't have any cell parts, how do they make new viruses? Well, bottom line, they get a cell to do it. They hijack a cell and uh, this is where the infection comes into place. So what ends up happening is the spike proteins will match with the receptor on the surface of a cell membrane. Now this is going to be um, very specific to the type of virus and the type of cell it infects. Uh, so rabies virus attacks nerve cells. Um, Norwalk viruses uh, infect intestine cells. Um, the coronavirus and H1, um, the, the flu viruses infect respiratory tissues and because they have different receptors. So what in, in, in basic idea, the virus hijacks the cell machinery. The, the virus gets into the cell um, and basically opens up and allows the nucleic acid to go in. The cell will copy the DNA or RNA um, and basically make new DNA or RNA for the virus particles. Now, the cells, the cell doesn't know that this is happening, right? All the cell knows is, hey, there's an mRNA, I'm gonna make a copy, or there's a DNA, I'm gonna make a copy. And it's just gonna do that because that's what cells do when you give them DNA or RNA. Um, and then the ribosomes are going to take those nucleic acids and make viral proteins. And then you're going to assemble, they're going to assemble uh, because of the way everything just comes together. The capsid proteins are going to form around the, vi the viral nucleic acids. And then usually what ends up having to happen is there's... Um, uh, one spike protein that gets in and then another type of spike protein can get out, allows the virus to get out. Uh, and so here's a very lovely uh, picture that can show you. So here we have a, in this case, an influenza virus uh, where the virus particle is getting into the cell. Uh, and then as the virus penetrates through the membrane, um, and that happens because of the receptor protein match, it's going to open up uh, and the viral contents are released um, and then the cell is going to do what it does best and that's make copies and make proteins 
assemble the viruses and then the virus particles release. This can go on and on and on and most human viruses, they don't kill the cell. You'll see in the lytic cycle, bacteriophages kill bacteria as they release. And some viruses can do that, uh, but the most damaging thing is if the cell doesn't die, it's just gonna keep churning out, churning out, churning out virus particles. And you can have upwards of, of 10,000, 20,000, 50,000 uh, cells. Now the cell might eventually die simply because everything is being used to make viruses. But in the meantime, you've made tens of thousands of virus particles and they're going to go on to infect the neighboring cells. So uh, here is our nemesis right now, uh, the coronavirus. You see three different models that uh, illustrate um, everything that we've been talking about. Here's our spike glycoproteins uh, that can get in and get out. Um, we have membrane proteins. Again, that's partly, this is an envelope virus that picks up the cell membrane from the cells it infects. You can see this is an RNA virus. And um, then you have the capsid proteins around it. Uh, so you're going to watch some videos of uh, how that show the virus replication process. And then you're going to watch how our immune system um, responds. So one of the interesting examples of this would be the flu virus. Uh, we actually haven't really had to deal with that this year because everybody's been wearing masks and staying separate. But the uh, flu uh, viruses are designated by their H and N for hemagglutinin and neuraminidase and uh, neuraminidase, there you go. And the H and the N refer to those different spike proteins. The H can go in, it causes the virus to go in. The N unlocks, it allows the virus to get out. Uh, and um, the H and the N, the reason I have blanks there is because we designate the variation. So the H, one N one, the H three N two, the H five N, and these uh, sometimes are very very virulent. So the Spanish flu was a type of H N. Um, the the uh, swine flu was a type of H N. These are all variations. Uh, so then you're gonna um, watch a video on how our cells. Uh, react uh, and respond to a virus? How do our immune systems work? And this is one of my favorite, favorite videos. When you watch this video, take note, there is a little mini soap opera going on. Um, and uh, I think it's rather fun that they try to make uh, some real life uh, going on there.